Welcome to the Caltex Theatre, a full hour of dramatic entertainment broadcast over a nationwide network of stations throughout Australia. The Caltex Theatre is brought to you by Caltex Oil, marketers of over a thousand outstanding petroleum products in association with Caltex dealers and distributors everywhere. Tonight in the Caltex Theatre, you will hear a special adaptation of the unusual Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer motion picture, Forbidden Planet, a fascinating science fiction story set in a world of tomorrow. Starring in Forbidden Planet, you will hear Lionel Stevens. Your producer, Cressick Jenkinson. <laughs> The Caltex Theatre presents Forbidden Planet, Act One. final decade of the 21st century, men and women in rocket ships landed on the moon. By 2200 AD, they had reached the other planets in our solar system. Almost at once, there followed discovery of hyperdrive, through which the speed of light was attained and later greatly surpassed. So at last, mankind began the conquest and colonization of deep space. Planets cruiser C-57D was more than a year out from Earth base on a special mission to the planetary system of the great main sequence star, Altair. When do we get a DC fix, Jerry? 30 seconds, Skipper. Ship on course, sir. We'll reach DC point at 1701. That's less than three minutes now. Chief, we'll drop back below light speed in about three minutes. Got your breakable gear stored? Aye, aye, sir. DC set and punched on, Skipper. All right, attention. Captain to crew. All hands squared away to decelerate. DC stations. Three eight nine six of light speed. The skipper, there's Altair coming up on the screen, right on the nose. Okay, Jerry, punch out an orbit on the fourth planet. Aye, aye, skipper. Ship and approach, skipper. Helical vector orientated. Attention, captain to crew. Attention. Our destination, Altair Four, is now visible on the main view plate. As you recollect from your briefing lectures, this is an Earth-type planet. Twenty years ago, the spacecraft Bellerophon landed here with a prospecting party of scientists. Our mission is to search for survivors. That is all. Well, that there it is. The Lord certainly made some beautiful worlds. What do you think about that, huh? Ah, uh, not one of them new oils. No beer, no women, no pool parlors, nothing. Nothing to do but throw rocks at tin cans. Well, we got to bring our own tin cans. Hey, 
Attention, captains and crew. We are now entering the atmosphere of Altair 4. No survival suits will be required upon landing. Oxygen content 4.7 richer than Earth standard. Gravity only 0.897. Adjust your equipment accordingly, that's all. All hands, check equipment. Jerry, can you make out anything down there? Well, maybe missing some individual structures, but as far as I can see, there are no cities, ports, roads, bridges, dams. There's just no sign of civilization at all. Mm. Sir, we're being radar scanned. Huh? Let me see that. There it is on the electronic equipment. Yeah, can you zero on it? No, oh, sir, but it seems to emanate from an area about 20 miles square. Boson, pass the alert. Aye, aye, sir. Combat stations, blast the men, activate your scope. Radio contact, sir. There's a voice here. Human? Yes, sir. Sounds like it. Boost it on the speaker. Space shift. Identify yourself. You are being tracked. Cut me in, Quinn. Yes, sir. United Planets Cruiser C-57D, J.J. Adams commanding. Who are you? Morbius of the Bellerophon. Who? Edward Morbius. Jerry? Uh, yep, yep, here it is. His name's on the passenger list. Morbius E, Ph.D., Lit D, Expedition Philologist. What do you wish here, Cruiser? We're your relief, sir. We're very glad to find you alive. Dr. Morbius, are you there? Naturally, I appreciate your concern. But absolutely no assistance of any kind is required. Well, the red carpet treatment, huh? Dr. Morbius, my orders are to survey the situation on LZ4. Let me repeat. I'm in no sort of difficulty here. Your best procedure will be to turn back at once without landing. Sorry, sir, but those aren't my orders. Commander, if you sit down on this planet, I warn you that I cannot be answerable for the safety of either your ship or your crew. Dr. Morbius, I require landing coordinates. I'll be obliged if you'll supply me with them. Very well, I wash my hands of all responsibility. You have standard charts. Yes, sir. You may come in at 83, 17, 4 north, 148, 21 west. Thank you. Got that, Jerry? It's right back there in the desert. Commander, I strongly urge you to reconsider. Quinn, cut him off. Please permit me to recommend... Yeah, there's something funny going on down there, Skipper. Well, we'll soon know what it is. Okay, Jerry. I'll take you in. Yes, sir. No sign of any living being. Thank you, Bosun. Look at the color of that sky. Left fantastic greenish yellow. Fantastic, Doc, but I'll still take blue. <laughs> oh, I don't know. The sky, the desert, the mountains. I think a man could get used to this and grow to love it. You uh, better check your command, Mike Skipper. Yeah, good idea. Chief. Sir. You're in command now, Quinn, back there in the ship. You keep right at those instruments while we look around. Aye, aye, sir. Hey, what's this dust coming? Dust. A column of dust sweeping towards us over the desert. Well, there must be a vehicle of some sort. Yeah, it looks like we're being met. Bosun, alert your men. Aye, aye, sir. The speed he's traveling. That driver must be a madman. What driver? You're right. There's a mechanical creature in charge of it. It's coming over to us. Take it steady now. Welcome to Alpha 4, gentlemen. It talks. I am to transport you to the residence. If you do not speak English... I am at your disposal with 187 other languages, along with their various dialects and such ones. No, uh, colloquial English will do fine, thank you. Ed, this is no offense, but you are a robot, aren't you? That is correct, sir. For your convenience, I am 
monitor to respond to the name Robbie. Hmm. Well, it's a nice climate you have here, Robbie. Uh, high oxygen content. I rarely use it myself, sir. With my metallic structure, it promotes rust. Uh, hey, Doc, uh, is, it, uh, is it a male or a female? <laughs> Cookie, I really couldn't say. In my case, sir, uh, the question is totally without meaning. Will you get in the vehicle, gentlemen? Uh, Doc, Jerry, come along with me. Right, right. Quinn, trace this vehicle. If I blink red back to you, you'll... I'll bring the tractor in a hurry, sir. Right. Hey, you Skipper. Just room for you. Passengers will please fasten their seat belts. Looks after us like a mother. <laughs> if you like. Have you ever seen a more gracious and attractive home? Exotic flowers, shady trees, pools of clear water? And there in the doorway, if I'm not mistaken, our unwilling host. I am Morbius. I'm Commander Adams. This is Lieutenant Farman, my executive, Lieutenant Astro, our ship's doctor. How ironic that a simple scholar with no ambition beyond a modest measure of seclusion should out of a clear sky find himself besieged by an army of fellow creatures all grimly determined to be of some service to him. I'm sorry, sir, if we're not welcome, but we do have our orders. Of course. And you must stay for lunch, gentlemen. Uh, do forgive the ill manners of an old recluse, if you can. Well, gentlemen, won't you come in? Well, whatever that lunch was, it was certainly delicious. Simply some of Robbie's synthetics. He's your cook, too, huh? He even manufactures the raw material. Now come around here, Robbie. I'll show you how he works. Now, oh, one introduces a sample of human food through this aperture in the upper part of Robbie's body. Down here, there's a small built-in chemical laboratory where he analyzes it. Later, he can produce identical molecules in any shape or quantity. Well, the housewife's dream. Plus absolute selfless obedience. But do not attribute feelings to him, gentlemen. Robbie is simply a tool. Tremendously strong, of course. He could quite easily topple this whole house off its foundation. In the wrong hands, mightn't such a, a tool become a deadly weapon? No, Doctor. Not even if I were the mad scientist of the thrillers. Because, you see, there happens to be a built-in safety factor. Uh, Commander, may I borrow that formidable-looking sidearm of yours? Thank you. Now, Robbie, point this thing at that fruit tree out there on the terrace. Fire! Hmm. The tree is disintegrated entirely. You understand this mechanism we are in? Yes, Morbius. Yes. A simple blaster. All right. Now turn around here. Point it at the commander. What? Now, wait a minute. Aim right between the eyes. Fire! You see, he's helpless. His whole electronic being is in a most distressing turmoil. He's locked in a sub-electronic dilemma between my direct orders and his basic inhibitions against harming rational beings. Order cancelled. If I were to allow that distress to continue, he would blow every circuit in his body. Dr. Morbius, how did you come by such a, a, a mechanism? Oh, I didn't come by him, Doctor. I just tinkered him together during my first two months here. What? You mean you made it? A useful enough toy left him. But nowadays I have no time for such things. Dr. Morbius... You're a philologist, an expert in words and languages, their origins and meanings. Yet this robot of yours is beyond the combined resources of all Earth's physical science. My dear Commander, I think you overestimate both Robbie and myself. Uh, gentlemen, let me now show you another bit of parlor magic. If I wave my hand over this beamer... Hey, we're trapped. Steel shutters over all the doors and windows. Now, forgive me, gentlemen, I did not mean to alarm you. I had Robbie install those steel shutters before I realized how altogether safe I am here. I just have to pass my hand over the beamer again, and they return to their original position. Oh, 
that's better. Hello, well, gentlemen. This has been very pleasant. You've seen how very comfortable I am here. No hardships, no special difficulties, and no need at all for military assistance. I dare say you will become impatient to get back to base. Yes, sir. The moment we've interviewed the other members of the Bellerophon party. The others? But there are no others, Commander. The what? Before the first year was out, they'd all, every man and woman, succumbed to a, well, a sort of planetary force here. Some dark, terrible, incomprehensible force. Only my wife and myself were immune. And how do you account for your immunity, Dr. Morbius? Well, my wife and I differed from the others in our special love of this new world, in our boundless longing to make a home here, far from the scurry and the strife of mankind. I remember how, when the boat was taken to return to Earth, she and I were utterly heartbroken. Skipper, there's no record of any wife on the list of the Bellerophon passengers. And Lieutenant, look under biochemistry, Julia Marson. She and I were married with a skipper on the voyage out here. I thought uh, Robbie had married some very charming feminine touches. I take it Mrs. Morbius isn't at home today. My dear wife died a few months after the others. And in her case, it was of natural causes. Oh. I'm, I'm very sorry. Dr. Morbius, just what were the symptoms of all those other deaths? The unnatural ones, I mean. The symptoms were very striking, Commander. One by one, in spite of every possible safeguard. My co-workers were torn literally limb from limb. By what? By some devilish thing that never once showed itself. And the Bellerophon? Vaporized as the three remaining survivors tried to take her off. And yet in all these 19 years, you personally have never again been bothered by this planetary force? Only in nightmares of those times. Yet always in my mind, I seem to feel the creature is lurking somewhere close at hand. Sly and irresistible, only waiting to be re invoked for murder. Father? Oh, Father! Father, I specifically asked you not to join us for lunch. Oh, but, Father, lunch is over. I'm sure you never said a word about not coming in for coffee. Well, did you or did you not? A girl. Her brother, is she terrific? Take it easy now, Farmer. And gentlemen, this is my daughter, Commander Adams, Dr. Ostro. How do you do? Lieutenant Farman. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? I've always so terribly wanted to meet a young man, and, and now, three of them at once. That's very kind of you. Oh, you're lovely, Doctor. <laughs> of course, the, the other two are unbelievable. <laughs> well, that puts me in my place. Uh, could this one get you some coffee? Oh, I'm quite able to get it. Oh, of course you are, but uh, come over here. And I'll get it for you. Hey, Commander. If I can be of any help to you in your preparations for the homeward voyage. Thank you, sir, but unfortunately, circumstances may keep us here for quite a while. Oh, circumstances? My orders don't quite seem to cover the Bellerophon fatalities. I'm forced now to contact base for new instructions. I bet, Commander. Suppose these new instructions require my return to Earth for questioning. Two years or more away from my work here? No. No, no, I... Uh... Tell me, just what is involved in your making contact with Earth Base? Well, fundamentally, it's a question of crude power, how to short circuit the continuum on a five or six parsec level. Of course, a transmitter of that sort isn't exactly standard equipment. No. To build one, we'd have to make use of about two thirds of the ship's electronic gear, then unship the main drive to juice it. Just to construct a bunker to house the core would take us about ten days. Disabled here for ten days and ten nights? Tell me, would two-inch lead shielding do just as well? Sure, <laughs> it'd be fine. If we happen to be carrying about a hundred square yards of the stuff. I'll have Robbie run some up for you. We'll have it not later than noon tomorrow. Oh, well, it's very obliging of you, sir. Obliging? Look out there, Commander. The graves of the Bellerophon party. I dug those graves of my own hands. Believe me, I had no wish to repeat that experience. Core, thank you, Robbie. Wait a minute. That's solid lead he's carrying. Common lead would have crushed the vehicle, sir. This is my morning's run of isotope 217. The whole thing hardly comes to ten tons. Pardon me, sir. 
Oh, uh, hello, Alter. Hello, Lieutenant. Does your father know you're out here? He did tell me not to go near the ship, but uh, this isn't very near, is it? You'd be farther away still if we took a walk. Oh, Robbie might come back. Oh, he's occupied over there. Cookie's following him around like a shadow. Now, come on, a walk's just what you need on a morning like this. Hey, Robbie. Can I be of service, sir? Uh, never mind about the sir. Uh, come over here where the skipper can't see us. Uh, look, uh, I'm nothing by a cook, so you don't have to be that polite. Uh, but I'm a stranger on this so-called planet, and I was just wondering if, um... Uh, well, if you could tell me where I could get hold of some of the real stuff. Real stuff? Uh, just for cooking purposes, you understand. I, I take a big pride in my duties. Pardon me, sir. Stuff? Oh, uh, just about one jolt left in this bottle. Now, this is it. Genuine Asian rocket bourbon. Hey, wait a minute. Hey, I didn't say you could drink it. <coughs> Why, you low-living contraption, I ought to take a can opener to you. Quiet, please. I am analyzing. Yes, relatively simple alcoholic molecules with traces of fusel oil. Would 60 gallons be sufficient? Gallons? Hey, Robbie, I've been from here to there in this galaxy, and I just want you to know, you're the most understanding soul I ever met up with. Tomorrow night, sir, it will be ready. Now, if you will pardon me, Miss Alta will be waiting. It's uh, nothing personal, Alta. Just a kiss. Oh, but, Lieutenant, why should people want to kiss each other? Oh, well, it's an old custom. All the really high civilizations go in for it. Oh, but it's so silly. Well, it's good for you, though. It stimulates the whole system. As a matter of fact, you can't be in tip-top health without it. Oh, I didn't know that. I'd only be too happy to show you. Oh, well, thank you very much, Lieutenant. Oh, it's no trouble at all. I... Oh. Is that all there is to it, this kissing? Well, you've sort of got to stick with it. Oh. Oh, could we try just once more? Do you mind? Oh, not at all. I... I don't know, Lieutenant. There must be something seriously the matter with me because, well, honestly, I, I haven't noticed the least bit of stimulation. Uh, honey, let's do this thing right. Uh, this time, let's really give it the works, huh? All right, honey, now just let yourself go and... Mm. Lieutenant Bob! Uh, uh, don't say another word, sir. I know there are a lot of pressing duties waiting for me back at the ship. You're right, Lieutenant. And rank does have its little privileges, doesn't it, sir? You can depend on it, Lieutenant, that those privileges won't be stretched into taking your kind of advantages. Well, I... Dismissed! Was... Yes, sir. Well, what's the matter? Why did you both act so funny? Well, don't you understand, Al, the... No? Well, look at yourself. You can't run around like that in front of men. It's... It was bad enough anyway, a girl like you, after a year in a spaceship, but when you're wearing nothing but that play suit, particularly in front of a space wolf like Farman, well, well, for Pete's sake, go home and put on something that's... Well, put on anything. What's wrong with my clothes? I designed them myself. Oh, don't you like the way I look? Stop looking at me that way. Elta, get out of here before I have you run out of the area under guard. Then I'll have to put more guards on the guards. Now get out of here, Alter. feeling, Joe. I stood guard over the spaceship before at night. There never were two moons in the sky. Yeah. Joe. Yeah? Do you hear something? Like what? Like a sort of big breathing. No. Well, that's funny. I, I did. No one around. You can see that. No sign of anyone or, or anything. Funny. Like a sort of big breathing. All right, both go 
guards claimed to have been at their post in the way. Yet the ship was entered. The heavy-duty hatch was raised and the latch back. Equipment was sabotaged. All this without anybody seeing or hearing anything. Same story from everyone, Skipper. When I don't care how you do it, but this gear has got to be patched up. Otherwise, we'll never get the transmitter working to contact Earth Base. And we'll never be able to take the ship home again when the time comes. Yeah. No one actually saw or heard anyone last night. Strong says... He... Yeah, yeah, I know. He thinks he heard something like... Like a big breathing. And so the curtain falls on Act One of tonight's Caltech play, Forbidden Planet. In a moment, we commence Act Two. The Caltech Theatre now presents Lionel Stevens in Forbidden Planet. Act Two. Well, you like my new dress, Commander? Well, I... It's long, you see. Nothing shows through. Also, I'm... I'm sorry about the way I spoke to you yesterday. I was, well, sort of bothered. I had this dress made especially for you. Though I didn't really want to see you. You still look at me in that funny way. I suppose there's just something personally about me that that, that you don't like. Alta, you always look quite beautiful. Well, then why don't you kiss me like everybody else does? Everybody? Hasn't your father taught you anything at all? Well, he says I'm terribly ignorant. But I've had poetry and mathematics and logic, physics and geology and... and bi Biology? Well, of course, that's mainly on the theoretical side. Oh, well, so far. But what's wrong with theory? This is what's wrong with it. Mm. Oh. Oh, that, that, that wasn't at all as I felt after the lieutenant kissed me. I feel different altogether. Oh, a wonderful, wonderful feeling. I must go back to the house. I, I have to see your father. This is the situation, Dr. Morbius. Last night, the ship was entered and our Clistron monitor was sabotaged. And you suspect me? Then the time has come to clarification. Sit down, gentlemen. In times long past, this planet was the home of a mighty and noble race of beings who called themselves the Krell. Ethically, as well as technologically, they were a whole million hit years ahead of mankind. For in unlocking the mysteries of nature, they conquered even their baser selves. In the course of aeons, they abolished sickness, insanity, crime, and all injustice. But then, seemingly upon the threshold of some supreme accomplishment, which was to have crowned their entire history... This all but divine race perished in a single night. Perished? Yes, Doctor. In the 2,000 centuries since that unexplained catastrophe, even the cloud-piercing towers of glass and porcelain and adamantine steel have crumbled back into the soil of Altair Four, and nothing, absolutely nothing, remains above the ground. However, under the ground... Under the ground, Dr. Morbius? Behind this room there is a tunnel. Now come with me, and I will show you wonders of which the human mind could never conceive. Of. Well, gentlemen, already you've seen a certain amount. You've seen krell metal with molecules so densely interlocked that your blasters make no kind of impact on it. You've seen mile upon mile of self-servicing, self-renewing machinery still functioning as perfectly as when it was constructed more than 2,000 centuries ago. Utterly incredible. You've seen their laboratories. What's this, Dr. Morbius? On this screen may be projected the total scientific knowledge of the Krell, from its primitive beginnings to the day of its annihilation. A sheer bulk surpassing many million earthly libraries. I turn this knob, and as you see, the panel lights up. Hieroglyphics appear. 
You're able to read this? A little. It's my profession. I started on it some 20 years ago. Eventually, I was able to deduce most of their huge logical alphabet. So I began to learn. And the first practical result was that robot of mine, which you gentlemen appear to find so very remarkable. Child's play. Why, I've come here every day now for two decades, painfully picking up a few of the least difficult fragments of their knowledge. A thing like this, it's too late to evaluate. Uh, Dr. Morbius, what this device? Oh, one could describe that as a brain booster. And as a headset, electrodes at each end. You can see it was designed for something far bulkier than my human cranium. And its function? I will activate it. Now, watch closely. A figure's appearing. It's Alter. Just a three-dimensional image, Commander. But it's alive. Because my daughter is alive in my brain from microsecond to microsecond whilst I manipulate. There. I remove the electrodes from my temples, and the image vanishes. It's something of a strain. Let me try. I put the headset on, I pull the switch. Now, is that right? Stop. But I want to... Commander, you'll never survive. Our Bellerophon skipper tried it. It was instantly fatal to him. Oh, so you're immune to this too, Dr. Morbius. In my first attempt at creating a brain image here, the shock rendered me unconscious for a whole day and a whole night. Yet you came back for a second go at it? It was a matter of science, Doctor. You can imagine my joy when I discovered that the shock had permanently, permanently doubled my intellectual capacity. Otherwise, my researches would have come to nothing, poor as they may have been. So that's how it happened. I have a great deal more to show you, gentlemen. Can you spare further time away from your ship? Yes, I believe so. I've left Lieutenant Farnham in charge. I've ordered him to set up a standard perimeter with a full scale of work. All right. All hands tank clear of the magnetic fence area. Yeah. Have you tested it yet, Bosun? Just about to do so, sir. Mm-hmm. Right. Toss the branch at it. How you going to spark, sir? Yeah, fine. I don't keep any unwanted visitor from entering the camp. See the full-scale alerts maintained, Bosun. Aye, aye, sir. A lieutenant. Huh? Oh, what's your trouble, Cookie? Well, I haven't completed my washing-up duties after chow. I request the lieutenant's permission to take a little walk outside the perimeter, sir. But there's nothing out there. Oh, sir, I thought it might brighten up the boys' mess a little bit if, uh, if I could, um, find a few wild radishes or something. Look, Cookie, um, I don't know what you're lying about, but, uh, you better get back here before the skipper checks in or we'll both get skinned. Yes, sir. Quinn, this is Farman. Kill the power on the fence. All right, Cookie, off you go. Yes, sir. I thank you, sir. All right, Quinn. Put it back on. Robbie, I ain't never gonna forget this. Bottle stacks of them. Oh, I gotta try it. Uh, wait a minute, Bobby. Genuine Kansas City bourbon. <coughs> Smooth, too. Uh, like I said, Robbie, anything I can do. Uh, anytime you're hard up for a couple of gallons of loop oil, uh, you just let me know, huh? Hey, what's up? You see something? Somebody coming this way? <coughs> no, sir. Nothing. Lieutenant! Lieutenant, the fence is going! Lieutenant! Sure. But there's no one coming through. Shall I have the current shut down, sir? No. No, it stopped now. Strange, that. Just shorting out. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, check out with the whole system first thing in the morning, boss. Aye, sir. Uh, that fence, the way it was shorting. Yes, sir. <laughs> Come 
Commander, you're too arbitrary. Perhaps I do not choose to be dictated to in my own world. But Dr. Morbius, a scientific find of this magnitude has got to be taken under United Planet supervision. No one man can be allowed to monopolize it. The past two hours I've been expecting you to make exactly this, such an asinine statement. Asinine? Just one moment, Commander. For close on 20 years now, I've been constantly, and I hope dispassionately, considering this very problem. Now I've come to the unalterable conclusion that man is unfit as yet to receive such knowledge, such almost limitless power. Whereas Morbius, with his artificially expanded intellect, is now ideally suited to administer this power for the whole human race. Precisely, Doctor. Such portions of the Krell science, as I may from time to time deem suitable and safe, I shall dispense to Earth. Other portions I shall withhold. In this, I shall be answerable exclusively to my own conscience and judgment. Dr. Morbius, in the absence of special instructions, you leave me in a very awkward position. I... I wanted to contact you from the ship. Adam speaking. Commander, this is Farman. Yes, Lieutenant. The skipper, the chief's been murdered. Quinn murdered? What? He was alone in the ship working on the monitor. The rest of us were all outside on guard duty. But how was it done? Done? Skipper, his body's plastered all over the communications room. Right. Leave everything as it is. We're on our way. Come on, Doc. It started again. Doc, that's the foot of whatever it was that killed Quinn last night. I made this plaster model from the footprints we found. Thirty-seven inches by nineteen. And the terrifying thing, Skipper, this thing runs counter to every known law of evolution. It it just doesn't fit into... into normal nature. Anywhere in this galaxy, it's a nightmare. Commander, are you ready to hold discipline on the cook? Yes, what's happening? Come on, cookie. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm obliged to remind you, sir, that... I gave him permission to go out last night. Did you give him permission to get falling down drunk, Lieutenant? Drunk, sir? Me, sir? Well, anyway, why did that robot argue me into drinking all that whiskey in the first place? You were with the robot last night? Oh, yes, sir. Him and me, uh, we kind of got to toast each other's good health. Uh, just for your cordial interplanetary relations, you understand? And that went on all the time, even while the chief was being killed? Well, certainly, sir. But you don't think I could have got that stiff in five minutes? All right, dismissed. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, come on, Cookie. Well, Doc, that just about washes the robot up as a suspect. And what does that leave us with? Maybe it leaves us with the same one we've always had. Morbius. But we were with him. Maybe you and I ought to drop over to the Krell Laboratory and get our brains boosted. Then maybe we could understand. Sir. Yes, Lieutenant. Dr. Morbius is here. Oh. Well, ask Dr. Morbius come in. Yes, sir. Skipper, what do you suppose he's... Oh, good day, Dr. Morbius. Well, Commander, I dare say neither of us really has slept last night. That's a pretty close guess. I warned you while your ship was still in space. I beg you not to land on the planet. Believe me, Commander, that's only a foretaste. The Bellerophon pattern is being woven all over again. What? Remain here, and the next attack upon your party will be more general and more deadly. Dr. Morbius... How do you know that? No. Well, I... I seem to visualize it. If you wish, call it a premonition. That is all I have to say, Commander. Well, Skipper, what do you make of that? I'd say it sounded like an ultimatum. We'll be ready. Tonight we'll be prepared for an attack. I want a clear field of fire in all directions. You've got it, sir. Fine, fine. Lieutenant. Sir. You get your trouble squad in hand. Yes, sir, they're in hand. But they're a little trigger happy. They're sort of edgy to see whatever's out there tonight. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jerry, look, this uh, might be a big deal coming up. Could uh, be the biggest, Skip. Well, I want you to know that I'm sorry if I kind of leaned on you. You've got to understand this. Stop type. knocking yourself out, Skip. She picked the right man. Huh? Oh. Skipper, radar just picked up something. Where away? At the head of the gully, heading this way. Automatic control? 
Batteries, fire. Hold fire. Dead on target, Skipper, but it's still coming. I'll stop it. Get back, Lieutenant. Ah! Batteries, fire. Batteries, cease fire. Skipper, it's still coming. Well, whatever it was, our main battery finally stopped it. You believe that, Skipper? No. No, it just went away for some reason. It'll be back. Doc, an invisible being that can't be disintegrated by atomic fission. No, Skipper, that's a scientific impossibility. Hypnotic illusions don't tear people apart, and that's what this thing did to our men tonight. Doc, you saw its shape yourself standing right there in those neutron veins. It must have been made of solid nuclear material. Renewing its molecular structure from one microsecond to the next. Bolson, I want the tractor. Ready, sir. So now we just pick up the girl and her father, whether they like it or not, do we? Section 86A, evacuate all civilians from disaster area. Yeah? You left out two very important words. Where feasible. Now, if you remember the Bellerophon expedition, their ship was vaporized trying to lift off. Which makes it a gilt-edged priority that one of us gets into that Krell lab and takes that brain boost. Well, I don't know of any other way we can hope to combat this thing. You remember what happened when the Bellerophon's commander took that brain boost? Yes, I remember that, too. Doc, in case we make it into the lab, I'll take first go at the booster. You hear me, Doc? I hear you, Skip. Bosun? Aye, sir. Leaving you in command while we visit Dr. Morbius. Get the ship operational. Do your best to wait it out for me and the doctor, but the second that fence starts to short again, you lift off. Right, Skipper. Let's go, Doc. How's sir. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. So glad. I've had the most awful dream that, that you... I'm all right, Alza. Why are you here? Tell me, what's happened? We were attacked. Three men died, including Jerry Farman. Oh! Oh, darling. That's why I came here. Before anything else happens, I have to see to your safety. How were you attacked? By what? I don't know. Nothing human, just some kind of big outline on the disintegrator beams. Alta, you can't explain it. No. Anyway, we fought it, and we lost, and I believe it'll come back. Well, then you must leave now. Darling, I'm not going without you. You can't possibly leave Father alone. I, I just can't. Then we'll take him with us. By force? I can't agree to that either. Also, you don't realize what's loose on this planet. But, but I'm immune, like both my parents. That's what your father says, but I don't believe it. Nothing could be immune to that thing up oh, there. Oh, darling, darling, please go. Please, if you love me, but go. Don't listen to me. Oh, go, oh. darling. Doc, can you talk some sense into this? Hey, Doc. Well, where is he? The Doc was right here. Lay him on the sofa, Robbie. The door is open into the tunnel. That's where Robbie brought him from. Doc, you took the brain boost. You ought to see my new mind. Up there in lights on the indicator. It's bigger than Morby is now. Easy, Doc, easy. Easy. Listen, Morby is to his... Too close to the problem. The Krell... The the Krell had completed their final project. True creation. Creation of life. Come on, Doc, let's have it. But... The the Krell forgot one thing. Yes, what? Monsters. Monsters from the id. The id... What's that? <laughs> well, talk, Doc. <laughs> Doc. Oh. oh, darling. How romantic. Oh, a fool, a middling idiot. As though his ape's brain could contain the secrets of the Krell. Father, he's dead. He was warned, and now he's paid. 
Let him be buried along with the other victims of greed and folly. Morbius, you've chosen for me. John, I'm ready to go with you. Hold her. No. Mother, she mustn't do this. She must be prevented. Morbius, what is the id? Young man, my daughter is planning a very foolish action. She will be terribly punished. What is the id? Id, 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 id. It's... Well, it's, it's an obsolete term once used to describe the elementary basis of the subconscious mind. Monsters from the id, the subconscious mind. What? Monsters from the subconscious. That's what the doc meant. Morbius, those machines in there, 8,000 cubic miles of Quistron relays, enough power for a, for, for a whole population of creative geniuses operated by remote control, operated by the electromagnetic impulses of individual quill brains. That, for what purpose? In return, that machine would instantaneously project solid matter to any point on the planet, in any shape or color they might imagine. For any purpose, Morbius, creation by mere thought. Why haven't I seen this all along? But like you, the quill forgot one deadly danger. Their own subconscious hate and lust for destruction. The beast, the mindless primitive. Even the quail must have evolved from that beginning. So those mindless beasts of the subconscious had access to a machine that could never be shut down. The secret devil of every soul on the planet, all set free at once to loot and maim and take revenge, Morbius, and kill. My poor quail. After a million years of shining sanity, they could hardly have understood what power was destroying them. But the one obvious fallacy. The last trail died some 2,000 centuries ago. But today, as we all know, there's still at large upon this planet a living monster. A monster created by the subconscious mind of someone. Your mind refuses to face the conclusion. Morbius. Morbius. What? Something approaching from the southwest. Breaking down trees in its path. The monster. That thing out there, well, it's you. It was your subconscious that created it. You're insane. You must be. How else would you have led it here? Where Alta must see it torn to pieces. You still think she's immune? She's joined herself to me, body and soul. Yes. And whatever comes. Forever. Say it's a lie. Shout. Let it hear you out there. Say you don't love this man. Not even if I could. Stop it, Robbie. Don't let it in. Kill it, Robbie. He can do nothing, Morbius. He knows it's your other self. Adams, I'm not a monster. We're all part monsters in our subconscious. That's why we have laws and religion. Into the tunnel, quickly. Morbius, you listen to me. We don't have much time. Your mind was artificially enlarged. Consciously, it still lacked the power to operate the great machines. But your subconscious had been made strong enough. I won't hear you. Twenty years ago, when your comrades voted to return to Earth, you sent your secret in out to murder them. Not quite realizing it, of course, except maybe in your dream. What man can remember his own dream? Well, at least when our ship was approaching from space, you remembered enough to warn us off. But then... When you thought you were threatening your little egomaniac empire, your subconscious sent its id monster out again. More deaths, Morbius. More murder. Even in you, the loving father, there still exists this mindless primitive. More enraged and more inflamed with each new frustration. So now you're whistling up your monster again to punish her for her disloyalty and disobedience. And if you don't do something about it soon, Morbius, it's going to be coming right through that door. Solid fell metal? Impossible. The machines are going to supply your monster with whatever amount of power requires to reach us. I'll just say you don't believe this of me. Tell me you don't. And it must be true. I must be guilty. My evil self is at that door. And I have no power to stop it. Father, you can help us. I've known you. Great and noble like the quail. Yes. Yes, I can help you. I can. You! Up there! No further! I deny you! I give you up! I deny you! Finished. All finished. Father. Strain, it's been too much. Commander, throw that switch. This? Yes, throw it. 
In 24 hours, you and Alta must be a hundred million miles away out in space. The Krell furnaces. A chain reaction has begun. Can't be reversed. Go. Go quickly. Ninety-eight million point six miles. We're clear now, Alta. That's Altair 4 on the viewplate? Yes, the bright speck below the star. Fifteen seconds, it'll all be over. Altair 4 will be destroyed. Your father and my shipmates all the stored knowledge of the Krell. Five seconds, four, three, two, one. There. The explosion. Alter. About a million years from now, the human race will have crawled up to where the Krell stood in their great moment of triumph and tragedy. Your father's name will shine again like a beacon in the galaxy. It'll remind us that we are, after all, not God. our Caltech's play, Forbidden Planet. In a moment, we will give you tonight's cast and tell you about next week's presentation in the Caltech's Theatre. Ladies and gentlemen, the producer of tonight's Caltech's play, Cresic Jenkinson. Thank you. Forbidden Planet was presented tonight by courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Propriety Limited. The script was adapted for radio by Richard Lane, and the special sound effects were devised and recorded for this production by Graham Moncrief. In the starring role, you heard... I played Dr. Morbius. This was Lionel Stevens. (laughs) The supporting cast was as follows. Robbie the Robot, Edward Heppel. Dr. Ostro, Leonard Teal. Lieutenant Farman, Richard Meekle. Quinn, Stuart Finch. The Cook, John Llewellyn. The Bosun, Al Garcia. And as Alta and Commander Adams, you heard Joan Lander and Hart McGuire. Thank you, Mr. Jenkinson. Next week in the Caltech Theatre, you will hear the saga of a family and of the famous shipping line they founded and struggled to keep afloat during years of depression and war. And in particular, it is the story of Caroline, daughter of old Sir Benjamin Hamilton, who with indomitable spirit and at a cost of personal happiness fought to make the Hamilton Line the premier shipping company of Great Britain. Be listening for this fine drama, Big Ben, in the Caltech Theatre next week. Remember, too, Crispin's Day, another outstanding production shortly to be heard in the Caltech Theatre. Now this is your compere, Rick Hutton, bidding you good night on behalf of your hosts, Caltex Oil, marketers of Caltech Super Gasoline and Caltex Gasoline, the world-famous RPM 1030 Special Motor Oil and Marfac Lubrication. (laughs) 